Okay, uh, Dee, uh, and, and uh, could you tell us a little bit about the house uh, before it was remodeled? Because it was remodeled uh, while Dad was uh, in the prison camp. Of course, I wasn't experienced in the remodeling part because it, it all took place after I left home here. But it, it, was, it was enlarged on both ends, back uh, on the... Um, the, the front, this living room was enlarged by six or eight feet, clear across, and then there's uh, the, the several things were done at the same time. The electricity was put in the home, and so was the plumbing. And then on the south uh, other end, uh, it was um, another bedroom was put on. Two bedrooms. Two bedrooms were put on besides. And so I wasn't experienced in any of those things after it was, it was done. Yeah. Uh, and, and before that time, there was a front porch out here, Beth. Right. You can see where the, where the end of the house was, where this is. This, then there was a front porch that was just screened in, and, and the folks put some canvas around. That's where Cleo and I slept. And I, I understand some of the rest of you later. But uh, the, the, that was Mom and Dad's bedroom. This was the living room. There was a door right here that you come in from the the kitchen, a swinging door, and we had a pot belly stove along here. Yeah. There was no fireplace there. So one, it, one of the things we remember with that swinging door right here where the uh, phone booth is, is that that uh, door we had a, a, would open both ways and we would go round and round and round with our bikes and trikes. Uh, Christmas time. Especially at Christmas time. We'd go round there, come around there and here. We'd go lickety split all the way around. And and wagons, yeah, Bud, you remember the wagons. Uh, uh, and and uh, I might mention while I'm up here, we had a, a Victrola that we played records, you know, 15-inch records, and uh, Mom would have the best music she could on those. And then we had the piano that was over right in over this there. corner, mm -hmm. and I remember many a time coming in there to practice when we didn't have a fire in the stove and your hands would get cold and you couldn't hardly play the piano. Donna, do you remember uh, making a game out of doing the, the linoleum floors? Oh, I don't remember the game, but I, I do remember that, uh, that we, it was a lot of linoleum, the dining room here and the living room here. And uh, when Mama had a, 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 a customer come out from Meridian that she was blind and her son drove her out to uh, measure a corset. I remember she said, mom said, Mrs. Taylor, is my house clean? I mean, I had cleaned it. I thought I'd really scrubbed that floor, but Mrs. Taylor rubbed her foot very kindly and gently over the floor and said, not very. <laughs> I remember that linoleum. But you remember scooting on rags. We'd, uh, you'd, you'd have to make a game out of polishing it. with. We'd yeah, because we used to have uh, wax polish that, uh, you know, you'd uh, have to polish it. And I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't write about that. I guess I, 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 it must have been work because I don't remember it too well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember coming home from school um, each day and looking forward to watch or listening on the radio. We had no television, strictly radio, but listening carefully, we'd huddle around the radio as children and listen to programs such as The Shadow, The Green Hornet, The Fat Man, uh, Gangbusters, and Sky King. And Sergeant I remember Preston. Sergeant Preston and the, of the Yukon. And I remember some of the programs that Cleo used to listen to Oxidol's, Oma Perkins, and Ma Bell, and some of those. But these were exciting times, strictly radio. Yeah, no TV. Uh, sometimes we would walk home from school, and sometimes we'd ride. Uh, Beth, did you want to talk about this riding home with us? Yeah. Well, we had a neighbor, and you know I can't remember who it was, but he had a, a box-type sleigh. And he would come along and pick us up, and boy, were we glad because we were walking three miles to school, and it was winter time. But he come in that sleigh and picked everybody up on the way. I remember that; it was wonderful. Cleo, can you come up here? You remember uh, uh, during that period of time, uh, what, before Dad was put uh, uh, on Wake Island, where before he went to Wake Island, uh, Cleo was uh, uh, placed in a, ho a special home over in Nampa. 
You remember that? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you were there uh, how long? Oh, I don't know. Five months. Five years. Five years. And yeah. they taught her how to make beds, how to cook, how to make bread. And when dad was uh, captured on Wake Island, she became the mother of the home. She did the ironing and the clothes and, and the making of the food the and getting ready board. for mom to come home and washing the clothes and making the bread. And I'm going to keep up their house clean and tidy off, <coughs> off babysitting. And they hired me a good housekeeper because I have uh, fed the children, put them to bed, reached to 8 o'clock hit, and I put them to bed. Then I uh, waited until the family came home and said, Clearly, you have your house all tidy and clean. And they pay me again. They asked me again. And I did that the same thing over again. I'm up there, yeah. get the children, come home. The supper, breakfast, the supper's all ready for them. And I always Phil could remember where everything was in the house. One time I couldn't find my shirt. And she says, Bobby, it's right where you left it. It's in the second drawer. It's such and such a place. <laughs> in this corner, I go in there, and there it was, exactly where she said it. And I didn't even think she ever went into my bedroom. But there mm -hmm. was, the same as she said. So yeah. she knew where yeah. everything yeah. was. Yeah. 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 I fixed lunches for their, their lunches for their school. And they well, come she home. Came, uh, she was in this special home over in Nampa. And when she came home from it, uh, she told all of us, she says, I don't want to ever go back there. Those people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the truth. That's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> yes. I enjoy it. Thank you. Well, she's been very, very special to us. Uh, uh, what about the seven? Uh, yeah, uh, Vaughn, uh, no, Vaughn, we can't cross uh, that out because uh, number seven is about uh, speaking contest, and uh, you saw the picture of Ben out there at the very beginning of this video uh, with his two trophies. All of us did a, a great deal in speaking uh, in school and in uh, uh, various functions. And Vaughn here uh, uh, won the state of Idaho in the FFA speaking contest, won the regional, and went all the way to Kansas City. National. National in second in Kansas City. I remember Mom training me on this, that uh, that speech that Claire Hunt helped me write. And uh, we, before this edition of this room, there was a porch out there, and there was a bed out there that Beth and Cleo and and sometimes I slept in it. But I sat on the edge of that bed, and Mom drilled me and drilled me and drilled me and. On, on specific words, how to give emphasis and wh where to de-emphasize, etc. She was a she was a master at seeing that each of her children uh, excelled in something that was good, and she helped me uh, a great she deal. Went to Elder Benson to help get some help for you, I remember. Yeah, she was uh, she was just a master at that and music. Uh, Bernie, the younger one who's uh, on a mission right now, he uh, memorized the uh, reading. It's called a dramatic reading and he won contests with it it's called homecoming and, and uh, over there they ran, did the same thing as bernie yeah, it all over. <laughs> anyway those uh, jay did it and vaughn uh, did, floyd did it but i think bernie became uh, uh, the best on it he uh, we have it actually on a recording at my uh, wedding reception but it is a very dramatic story about the war and and things called homecoming uh, if we get a copy of that, that would be worth, uh, worth uh, anybody listening to. Um, all of us remember uh, uh, coming home and mom coming home and she grabbing us and putting in her down in the lap and, and uh, digging in our ears with a bobby pin and, and uh, pinching us and getting blackheads and things. And <laughs> those are fond memories and, uh, and again, uh, kissing us and stuff. So uh, we... Uh, uh, those are fond memories. Uh, one time, uh, Barbara, could you come up and, and tell about Ben here uh, and the sickness that he had? Um, uh, all I know is when Ben was uh, about 14 or 15, I know he was in high school, he became extremely ill to the point that he uh, uh, was quarantined and remained at home for quite a long period of time. He had to bring his books home and do his studies at home. But during this time, uh, Dad and Mom were trying to determine what they could do to keep his mind occupied and keep him busy. And, 
And this was when dad tried to teach Ben how to do genealogy, and Ben couldn't understand it. He just could not understand, and dad was getting frustrated with Ben because it didn't come quickly to his mind and easily. And so uh, one night, uh, well, one morning when he woke up, he came to dad and he says, Dad, he says, I understand. I know how to do genealogy. He said, I had a dream, and he says, I understand it clearly. And that's why Ben became the family genealogist uh, for years after he was married. He had that experience. Yeah, that's very good. Well, I remember when Ben was sick. I think he was probably three years old, and before we remodeled the house, he was lying on the sofa here, and he, the folks had lost two brothers before I was born, uh, two sons, from this very same thing, and they were scared to death because he was so sick that they called the doctor out, unbelievable, and the doctor said, if you don't get him to the hospital tonight, he'll die. Well, the folks couldn't afford even the gas to go to Boise, let alone pay for a hospital or a doctor, so they drew all of us together, and I counted it as a family-participated blessing because we all stood there while my dad blessed that boy, we all participated with our faith. And you know, then we went to bed. And the next morning when we came down, they, he had his Christmas sock with that one orange and one banana that you got once a year. And he was enjoying that sitting up on the sofa. Hmm. Uh, every Thursday night, we had what we call a family home evening. And that's when we would... Uh, tell stories, have a lesson, and uh, sing. Uh, we'd always give parts. I think it was on a Thursday night, if I remember correctly. Ron, uh, what are some of the other things that we would do? Well, way back at the turn of the century, President Joseph F. Smith suggested to the church that they have a family home evening, but no one really took it seriously, but mom and dad did. And they had a, a family home evening regularly with their children and their family long before the church really began to emphasize it. That was a great time because we'd sit around the piano and sing together as family. We would play games together. We would have pop popcorn and, and uh, often have uh, treats. It was a typical family home evening, and it was a wonderful thing that mom and dad. Mom was incredible at keeping her family together, and she did it right here in this home. We didn't have to go outside the home to have a, an enjoyable time, and we never really desired to go to functions in town or at school. Or it was here. How do you make taffy and make it white? Have, have, let Vaughn tell you that. Vaughn's the expert, and I'm going to have him even teach me again. I know we did it, but I'm going to have him tell me. There's two secrets in making taffy. One is cooking it. You've got to cook it just right. It's about 300 to 310 degrees if you're going to use a thermometer. But you cook it until the bubbles are large and slow. You, it's it's uh, two to one. Two of, of uh, sugar to one of vinegar. That's the ratio. Two to one. Whatever you amount you want. Two barrels to one barrel or <laughs> mouthfuls. Whatever. And, and, you, and cook it um, fairly rapidly at first. And, but when it gets... Uh, Near that temperature, you would slow down the heat or you'll burn it before it actually gets cooked properly. And then uh, uh, while you're, uh, that's happening, you butter your pans. And then you, uh, when it gets to that temperature, you get a cup of cold water and take a teaspoon and take the taffy and, and take a teaspoon and drop it in the cold water. Mm -hmm. If it gets hard uh, very quickly, it's done. If it doesn't get hard, you cook it a little bit more slowly. Don't burn it. That's the key. The first key is to get it done without burning it. And you don't stir it. You do not stir it at any time. No. And when it's done, you pour it in the butter pan. And again, you don't scrape the pan with any spoon. You pour out what comes out and let the children have the rest. Uh, uh, scrape in the pan. Right. When it's cold enough so that you can pull it, uh, then the, that's the second in getting it white, is pulling it. And um, Make some hold, it, hold this. Uh, the, the secret in pulling it is pull it out by the end of your fingers. Don't get a hold of it and pull it out that way. By the end of fingers, pull it out, lap it back across, 
and then get it, twist it, pull it out, lap it back across, get it, twist it, and, and you just keep doing that. And, and, and this lapping it, your wrists go the certain way so that the twist comes automatically. If you don't twist it, you'll have stringy taffy all over the place. Mm -hmm. But twisting it keeps it all together. Yep. Keeps it all together. And what does it happen? It goes from what color to what color? It goes from uh, gold. yellow, golden yeah. color to white, silvery white. Silvery white. It's it does. It's, it is yeah. beautiful. It actually changes the taste of it, too. <laughs> yeah, you cut it into little sections so it was just a bite size. When you put the vanilla in it, why you pull it? Only. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> One of the children tried that. They, they tried to put the flavoring in while it was cooking. Thought, well, that's the time to put it. That ruined it. You don't, you don't, you put the flavoring in or the coloring, whichever you want, while you're pulling it. While you're pulling it. Mm -hmm. Got that. Relative to the games that uh, mom, uh, we played with mom, I've always felt that of all of the things that we did in the home, other than our activity in the church, that playing games with mom uh, probably helped us more than any other single thing. See, mom didn't just play games with us. She also taught us great principles. Number one, she taught us to think and to think fast. She didn't tolerate somebody being slow in making any kind of a play in any game. Number two, she uh, taught us that we could not argue. If we argued, the game went right in the fireplace. Uh, or if we ever cheated, she didn't allow those things. She taught us while we were having fun, and while we were having fun with mom, we were teachable. I've always felt that of all of the things that mom and dad did. But she was highly con competitive. Very competitive. In fact, I, I, there were times when, uh, one time in particular, we stayed up until 2 o'clock in the morning because mom wasn't willing to concede that she got beaten. We weren't willing to concede that we got beaten. So we had a lot of fun. We'd rather play games with mom and our brothers and sisters than go with anybody else. There was, uh, we used to play Pinochle. That was a game with face cards. We played that until one of the brethren said that uh, face cards should not be in our home. I don't ever recall of playing Pinochle well, since I that time. Well, I remember her throwing them in the fireplace and <laughs> watching them burn. <laughs> <laughs> she, she did, she taught us to follow the brethren. I think that's an extremely important thing that she taught us. Follow the brethren, no question marks, just follow them. And in games, uh, she, uh, she really taught us to be competitive, and as a result, every one of our families and our children's families play a lot of games. What game uh, is the one that has become famous oh. for Packers? <laughs> it's it's yeah. called Make a Million. N none of us have made that, but uh, Make a Million is the, the official name. But the Parker brothers who made the game finally quit making them. I guess we were the only ones who were playing it. But, but so we had, uh, after the... Uh, Legally, we could do it. We printed uh, some of our own, and we call it the Packard. 4,000. 4,000 copies of, 4, and we called it Packard Legacy. <laughs> so anyway, we uh, Make a Million has become a very uh, uh, famous game for the Packard family still to this day. And, and tonight, probably we'll be playing Make a Million. <laughs> well, Mom was competitive, uh, not just in, around the game table, but out in the, in the wheat field. Uh, the, the, the wherever she played games, no matter what we were doing, working or playing. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, Mom taught us to be competitive, but she also let us know that she loved us. And it was mentioned that uh, we would sometimes get to lay our head on her lap, and she would uh, clean our ears with a bobby pin. But uh, she would also caress our, run her fingers through our hair. Mm -hmm. And we knew that she loved us by the way she would treat us individually on certain sweet occasions. Yeah, that's true. Well, I want to mention something. We talk about all the things that mom did, but back in my day, I can remember when dad played games with us too. Mm -hmm. And when dad had parties here, not in this bigger room, but in the other, many a party. And dad was just as much fun as mom. But after dad was taken prisoner, then you younger children all remember mom. Mm -hmm. But we, um, I remember we were all around the table once uh, playing spoons, if you know what that game is, mm -hmm. playing spoons, and, and a bunch of us kids were there just enjoying ourselves. Dad snuck up behind us, knowing what he was doing. He hit the table. All of us grabbed for a spoon, and everybody by mistake. <laughs> uh, 
we all uh, sang a lot, uh, not just Bill, but uh, we uh, sang around the, the piano. We sang in lots of meetings, and as we grew older, we continued to sing. And some of them took voice lessons, some of us didn't. And uh, Vaughn and uh, Donna, you had voice lessons. Beth, you had voice lessons. No, Donna didn't. I know Beth and Vaughn did, and Floyd did. Uh, yes. Uh, at this time, we're going to hear Vaughn sing two of the favorite songs of the family. Uh, these songs were favorites of Dad, and he used to sing them. Yeah, he sang them a lot. I'm getting emotional now. <laughs> yeah, Dad. The, he sang "Patter of the Shingle." And at weddings, he would sing the mother-in-law song. Is that the night? Getting ready for my mother-in-law. When the angry passion gathering out on my mother's face I see, then she takes me to her bedroom, gently lays me on her knee. Then I know that I will catch it for my flesh in fancy itches, as I listen to the patter of the shingle on my britches, every tingle of the shingle has an echo and a sting, and a thousand burning fancies into active being spring. Yes, a thousand bees and hornets neath my coattail seems to swarm. As I listen to the patter of the shingle, oh, so warm. In a sudden intermission that appeared my only chance, I cried, oh, strike gently, mother, or you'll split my Sunday pants. Then she stops a moment, gets her breath, the shingle holds aloft. Then she says, I never thought of that, my son, just take them off. Holy Moses and the angels look with pitying glances down. Now you good old family doctor, put a nice soft poultice on. And may I with fools and dunces everlastingly have to mingle. If I ever say a word again while mother wheels the shingle. You know what I just, what I just now saw? I saw a pheasant just just now fly across right <laughs> over there. <clears throat> that was good, Vaughn. You got that. Uh, what about the mother-in-law mother song? He he would sing this at uh, weddings. Um, Dad had a beautiful voice. He did. He did. My dear wife met me at the door, a letter in her hand, said mother soon twill visit us, now isn't that just grand? She said she'd stay about six months or longer if she can. If she don't come, I'm sure I'll be a disappointed man. I'm getting ready for my mother-in-law, getting ready for the fun. When she puts her face inside the place, you can see her take it on the run. If she should stay for just one day, you can hear the church bells chime. Oh, mother, 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 you'll have a dandy time. I fixed a little room for her without a window pane. I turned on the steam and fixed it so it wouldn't turn off again. No pictures hanging on the wall, it looked just like a cell. And when she goes to get in bed, she'll think that she's in H. I'm a getting ready for my mother-in-law, getting ready for the fun. When she starts to boil, her face will spoil. The makeup then will start to run, and Mama soon will be at rest while the church bells sadly chime. Oh, mother, 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 you'll have a hot old time. I taught my bulldog how to bite, the parrot how to swear. I took the springs and arms and back from our best rocking chair. I sprinkled soap upon the floor and polished it with fat. If she falls down and breaks her neck, can I be blamed for that? I'm a getting ready for my mother-in-law, getting ready for the fun. When she sticks her face inside the place, I can see her roll and skating some. If she falls flat on our tomcat, you will hear the church bells chime. Oh, mother, 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 mother. 
you'll have a skating time. <laughs> I can just hear Dad singing it. Well, um, other songs that I remember, uh, uh, Mormon Boy is one that Bill sang and I sang. We're not going to sing that at this time. And I uh, wanted to mention that uh, Dad was in the first branch presidency here in Meridian. And uh, D, uh, uh, D here was the first missionary to go from, uh, for our church from the uh, uh, Meridian uh, area. Branch. branch. Yeah, uh, that was a group. <coughs> the Meridian branch was a branch of the Boise Second Ward. And so we uh, met as a branch. I was called on a mission, not by my bishop or branch presidency, but by President Joseph, B I mean, um, Ezra. Ezra Tapp Benson. And I, I, um, he asked me to, uh, told me about going on a mission. And I said, well, I'd have to think about it. So that night, I went home to the folks. And Beth was there visiting, and so was my parents. And I told them I'd been called on a mission. And they were just tickled pink about the whole thing. And so I went back to President Benson and told him that I was planning on going, but I wanted to go fast. You went to California, and at the time, uh, Ezra Taft Benson was our stake president here in, uh, in the Boise Stake. He met his wife in the mission field. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Ivalu Larson. Uh, Donna, come, uh, you can pick this one up here on, on uh, Missing the Church. Well, it snowed so much out here, we couldn't get that Model T Ford uh, to go. And you boys said, well, let's start it down the hill. We can do that. And Mom said, no, there's too much snow. We can't even get it out. And so she said, uh, 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 for me to wear my warm clothes. And I said, no, I want to wear my new Sunday dress uh, that I got for Christmas. No, you get something warm on. Daddy brought in wa rocks and said, Esther, put these in the, in the uh, oven and then cover them with blankets to put at our foot because we're uh, taking the sleigh to church. And Dee said, why do we have to go to church? And uh, why can't we skip? And, and Dad said, no, we're new here, and we're just starting a new branch. We all have to be there. I only remember in that uh, American Legion Hall freezing while they got the pot-bellied stove going, gathering up cigarette butts and old beer cans until it got warm, and then we divided the building in with sheets until we could eventually build our own chapel. Uh, Vern Law, the baseball pitcher, was uh, father was the first, uh, uh, Jess Law was the first branch president, mm -hmm. and dad was his, uh, one of his counselors. Uh, Floyd, uh, uh, could you tell us uh, uh, about that experience that you... You had. You mean to go into church? Yeah. <laughs> there was one time when all of our dad was in the prison camp at this time, and we were uh, getting ready to go to church. And uh, when we would go to church, we would all get into the one car. We only had the one car at that time. That meant we had two layers in the front seat and three layers in the back seat. Well, something went wrong uh, while I was there uh, because I said something to mother, who was sitting in the front. Vaughn was driving. And I said something that I shouldn't have said. Vaughn turned the car off, got out, opened the back door, dragged me out, knocked me down, got back into the car. Mother sat over there, didn't say a word. I licked my wounds, got back into the car, and we drove off to church. I learned a great lesson. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you one other thing. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was one time when, when uh, Dad was gone, and uh, I don't know what uh, got into me, but uh, anyway, I just said, I don't want to go to church today. Mom says, fine, says, uh, you can stay home. And she says, while we're gone, I want you to do the dishes. I want you to mop the floor, and I want you to do this and this and getting ready for, the, for dinner so when we get home from church, we can eat. And I spent the whole time while they were at church, I was working. And when they came home, I decided I was never going to skip church again. It just wasn't <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Uh, Bob, do you have time for an extra story? Uh, one time, Seth Hawkins, who, who had one of the uh, uh, quick, quick meal like like uh, McDonald's, Red Steer. Red Steer. Red Steer. He invited our family out to dinner to his place. Well, we had such a big family; we very seldom were invited to dinner. But you can imagine, Mom 
cautioning us how to act and what to do and what to say. Well, we went out there to their place to dinner, and they were sort of big shots, we thought. Well, pretty soon she brought a bowl of, big bowl of cereal and milk and such. On Fast Sunday, they had their cereal and such for dinner, and that was our dinner. And I remember these boys staring at it and looking and mom giving him a stern look. That's what we had for Fast Sunday out <laughs> uh, In church, we, we were in choirs. Uh, uh, all of us were in the choirs at church. In fact, at one time, Donna was the director of the choir, and we had five uh, members of the family. Uh, we have a picture of that with Donna directing that choir, and there's five of us, myself and Ben and Bernie and Barbara and... Uh, there was only four of us then. So anyway, we were in the, in the choir. Uh, uh, we had a, a lot, Bud, Bill, you're gonna have to help me on this one. Come on up, Bill. Uh, but we had, there was so many of us in the car uh, going to church, uh, sometimes uh, 12 and 13 in the car together. And one of the things that we would do when we came home from church, there, there would always be a contest of who could get in the house the quickest. Well, this one time, this uh, Sunday morning, they all piled into the car, and because I was dressed first, Mom asked me to go turn the cows from the pasture here to the upper pasture. I go down there, and just as I'm closing the gate, there they are driving off the road going across the bridge, and I run across there yelling at them, and they didn't even see me. And so anyway, um, I come uh, uh, that day, they went to church in the morning, and then they went to my sister Beth's place in the afternoon for dinner instead of coming home. And here I was home all alone, all day long. They went to church the evening service uh, that night. And they come in, and these two kids pile out. Bill's the fastest runner. And he runs in the house, and I'm already in the kitchen there. And he runs in and sees me, and he says, how did you get in the house so quick? <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't missed me all day. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but these well, two. To make, it ma to make matters worse, he had his other clothes on, his everyday clothes on, and we couldn't figure out how he changed his clothes so fast. That's the only time anybody was left. Ron, did you want to tell him that? The I've got two stories. We missed one here on singing a Mormon boy. You mentioned that we often sang a Mormon boy. Um, Floyd and I were just little kids. I was probably five or so, and Floyd probably a year and a half older. We were asked to sing in, in, in church uh, a Mormon boy, and we practiced, and we had it all down, and when it came time for us to sing, I couldn't get started. I couldn't find the right note. We, it was a duet, and it was harmony, but I couldn't find the right note, and we tried and tried and over and over again, and finally we got it. Well, Floyd was so upset with me, he came out of the meeting and, and he says, I'm never going to uh, sing with Braun again, <laughs> ever. And, uh, but he has. We've sung uh, several times. Uh, speaking of getting left, um, I, was, uh, I was sent out one time when we had a, a, a semi-annual. About every six months, one of the great trips that the family would take would be to go to our cousin's place at Aunt Clara and Uncle Earl's place over in CUNA just outside in the kind of the desert land of Cuna. It was just a wonderful it's trip. Oh, it was, it was something we looked forward to for six months because they had kids our same age, and it was really a, a special trip. Well, just before we, we, we were ready to go, Mom sent me out to gather turkey eggs, and I went out and was gathering turkey eggs, and when I got in, everybody was gone, <laughs> and I was here alone, and I, I thought, I how could they leave me on the most important day of the year, and, and about... Two hours later, uh, they sent. They found out that I was missing, and they sent Jay, my older brother, to come back and get me. It was quite a trip. One of the only good things of that whole experience was I got to sit next to the window all by myself. <laughs> oh, oh, golly sakes. Well, these last stories here are about Christmas because Christmas was in this room and that room. Uh, before the house was remodeled, this was a kind of a square thing, and, and Dad would put a two-by-four across there and hang the stockings. One of us, e each of us had a stocking. And uh, you remember we would get, uh, the older ones would get the, the longer silk stockings, and we would stretch it so that we would get more, more stuff for Christmas uh, in our stockings. Uh, 
let's let's talk about some of our Christmases real quick. Um, uh, let's uh, let's start with uh, with uh, okay. Let's get, let's get Bud up here. Where are you, Bud? Let's let's skip down to number forty-one, and uh, we can come back and pick up some of those others. Uh, we uh, Bud was, I think, fourteen years old. Maybe, maybe twelve or thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> you were fourteen, Bud. I was. I thought I was twelve. And he was getting teased at school about Santa, and so I remember him talking to Bill and I, and he was planning to really go after Santa. You need to understand, though, that the previous year. The Santa Claus came out, and I looked at his shoes, and they're the same ones that Vaughn wears. <laughs> and so that kind of gave it away. And I, uh, I, I, I began to have some questions, but and then, then I, I learned my lesson the following year. But anyway, uh, Santa Claus came, and uh, and I'd agreed that I was going to pull on his beard to uh, make sure that you know to test it to see if it really was Santa Claus. Because I knew that if I pulled his beard, it would come off. And um, when I pulled on his beard, uh, it didn't come off, and it hurt him, and he jerked back and, and hollered and uh, ran out of the room, ran out of the house. With all the presents. Yeah, he took all of the presents, so it turned out to be a pretty bad thing. <laughs> um, where's L&D? Uh, Barbara, you were there with L&D. Uh, is L&D coming in? One of the things we would do when Santa would come was we would hide and everything. And so we were all hidden. And at that time, Beth and her family were here. This is Ellen D. And uh, she, uh, she was hiding with Barbara uh, when, uh, when Bud went up to... We were hiding right over here by the couch. And Bud went up and said, you're not real Santa. And yanked his beard, and it was the real Santa. And he let out a yelp and ran out. And Barbara and I just sobbed and sobbed because Bud had ruined our Christmas, and we knew Santa wasn't going to come and give us any presents now. <laughs> we were sick. <laughs> I remember it too. <laughs> that was a good experience. Uh, let, let's let's hear from Beth and Donna then about uh, the uh, other times that they are Christmas. <coughs> Well, this particular Christmas, uh, we, we, for some reason or other, we didn't wake up as early. It must have been 3 or 4 o'clock, but anyway, Santa hadn't come. Our stockings were empty. There was nothing there. And so we, Mom told us to go back to bed. We woke up again. There was still, if we went to sleep. But anyway, finally she said, well, Santa isn't here. And Dad told him to let's go out and get the chores done then. So they went out and did the chores. Still, no Santa. All of a sudden, I don't know who yelled, but they said right down the road there, looks like Santa's coming. He, was, he had a little red wagon and a great big white bag loaded in that wagon and trying to pull that wagon. And boy, Mom said, get down there and help him. So these boys all ran down there and helped Santa up the <laughs> hill. I remember that, uh, that Christmas. Uh, I think we must have had to sell a cow to Jippo Joe because we only had $50 to spend for Christmas that one year. And so uh, Mom t uh, stayed home with the little ones, and Dad and uh, uh, we went to Nampa, where we had lived when I was born, and uh, shopped. And all of us were very careful with our shopping, and then we put all of the presents in this one big sack to save. And uh, pretty soon we were to meet at the car. And when we got there, Dad said, okay, put the presents in the, I think, a trunk or somewhere. Ah, oh, where was the sack with the presents? We went back to every one of the stores and looked and looked and looked, and we could not find. We lost all of our $50 worth of presents. So when we came home, we told Mom, and do you know she was so uh, ingenious she had every one of us make a present for the other persons. That turned out to be one of the best Christmases we ever had. <laughs> That's good, Donna. That's good. Uh, we already mentioned that we had an orange and a banana in the, in the sack, in the sack uh, and we talked about going round and round. Uh, Bill, you had one here. 
uh, during the night when Christmas Eve, I needed to go to the restroom. And so I got up, uh, and it was probably around midnight, but uh, I couldn't help myself. Um, I had to s come to this swinging door that they had here and s peek in. And the sight that I saw was the Christmas tree lights were still on, creating unusual shadows throughout the room. The stockings, long stockings, were filled with the banana sticking out the top and a bulged orange on the bottom, but they were filled, nearly touching the floor. There was toys around the trees and so forth, and my eyes were bulging, and I knew that Santa had been there, and I still believed in Santa. And all at once, while I was admiring that, somebody came up and grabbed me on the shoulder and says, Bill, what you doing here? And it was Vaughn uh, that caught me looking through the door. And then Donna came in right behind him and says, Bill, you better go back to bed. And I says, I can't. Santa's been here. And uh, anyway, I went back to bed. But undoubtedly, Vaughn and, and Donna knew that I couldn't sleep. And, and so I think we had Christmas early that night. Okay, we're, uh, we're here in the, this is mom's bedroom. This is one of the rooms that was added afterwards, along with the uh, boys' bedroom, which is the next one. Mom and dad uh, stayed in this bedroom. Uh, uh, in fact, the older girls sometimes stayed in this bedroom here. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, number uh, 10 there, everybody. Uh, let's talk about mom when she became uh, um, mother of the year. Mother of the year. Uh, Beth, did you want to stand and uh, and because uh, you you went back with her, uh, our our mother was uh, by this time, uh, Dad was home from the prison camp, and uh, she had uh, 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 Mom had uh, all these children, uh, seventeen children, and uh, was taking care of them while Dad was in the prison camp. Uh, she was nominated for uh, Idaho Mother of the Year. 1952. Which, it was 1952, but it, it was a real honor because they stressed the fact of what, what her family had done, how they had been educated and trained and such. Uh, Don and Kenneth drove back and, and uh, uh, Bob, Bill, Ben, ben Bernie. Bernie, and I. Daddy took care of my family so I could go. Anyway, it was great, and they asked, uh, they needed to have a, a short synopsis or history of Mom's life, which I wrote, and Mom made several trips to Marsing, where we lived at that time, and helped me write that, that or gave me ideas of how to write that, which was good. Well, at the hearing, we stopped in Chicago on the way uh, to welcome travelers. It's a radio and, program. It, it was a radio program at that time, and... Uh, when they found out that mom was Idaho Mother of the Year and such, they asked us to sit around a table and they gave us each a, a form to fill out and uh, who we were and all the different things. Anyway, asked first if we could stay overnight, which we did. We stayed overnight and then she was on the next day and uh, she was highly honored. They gave her a lot of kitchen appliances, The uh, toasters, yeah. coffee maker that we never used. Uh, and the, old and the new electric stove. No, the stove and a string of pearls and mm -hmm. I mean a lot of things uh, because of her outstanding life. I had phoned home to Wendell, my husband, and so they knew it was going to she was going to be on that day on TV, and it was an honor. Uh, the thing that I remember mo uh, along with it was she received so many gifts and such. But the couple of boys that were on after her was more outstanding. They were both uh, soldiers. Both had been damaged. One of them blinded in both of his eyes. The other one, one eye was blinded. And, uh, and uh, anyway, they were there. The one had the, let's see, both of them were blind, blinded. But one had uh, his eyes operated on. 
And they, he says, if you can fix that eye, I want you to give it to my buddy. And so both boys were on the TV program that day, both with one eye a piece that worked, and uh, they both had originally belonged to the one boy. They received more gifts than Mom did, but it was tremendous. Mom was specially honored and told uh, because uh, they, they didn't choose a, a second place, but she was specially honored. They announced that uh, her outstanding life was very good. Anyway, um, we, uh, we got to go back with her, and we're going to uh, uh, talk about that just a little bit later, too, uh, to Washington, D.C. She was presented a certificate by uh, the governor of the state of Idaho, and uh, one of the pictures that you're, you saw at the very beginning of this video is uh, the governor of Idaho presenting that certificate to her. Um, Let's, uh, I might mention that the next year, <coughs> Sister McKay, David O. McKay's wife, was Utah's Idaho mother, not Utah, Idaho, Utah mother of the year. Yeah. Uh, uh, I might mention the Austin Batters. That took place in 1953. It had to. Not 52? No. The reason why is because I was in the Navy in 1953 in boot camp. And in April 1953, the Navy sought me out and brought me into their office and done a write-up on me uh, because Mom was Mother of the Year of Idaho. And anyway, that was... On the, ship. Mm -hmm. I thought it was in 1953 also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the reason for the decorated room here, I might as well mention that to you, uh, is the uh, mm -hmm. house is going to be uh, burned down and so the two girls that have been staying in this room uh, that own this house right now uh, were given permission by their parents to write on the walls all they want. And their friends wrote on the walls, they wrote on the walls, so they have decorated this way. Uh, uh, Vaughn, uh, let's go back up to uh, number two there and you can tell us uh, what happened. This road that's right in front of the house here was all dirt road, and along the side of the road, because of the rain, uh, there would be a lot of green vegetation, and m Mom would ha or da and Dad would have us herd the cows uh, along the road to eat all that vegetation, because in the f pastures, the, the, the grass was not adequate for, for the number of cattle we had. Well, we were herding the cows one time down in the flat um, toward Meridian, um, below the canal, and we found part of a cigarette and uh, made the comment, uh, I was about seven years old, Donna was about six, and made the comment, wouldn't it be something if we could find a match to light it and smoke it? Well, lo and behold, we found a match. I don't know how we did that. Uh, I, Satan must have been at work. But anyhow, we smoked it. And we went home, and when we went in the house, Mom smelled it. And she said, all right, go out and get a stick. Well, we'd heard that before, so we went out and got a small stick, and, it, and sure enough, she sent us back out to get a larger one. And we took it in, and sure enough, that wasn't big enough, she sent us out again to get still a bigger one. So we got a piece of two before, about uh, 18 inches long. And went in, she said, all right, that's fine. Come on in the bedroom. And then she explained to us that uh, uh, it seemed obvious that she had not taught us adequately about the evils and the bad of smoking. And therefore, we were going to have to spank her. Oh, we cried. She got on the, be the bed. The bed was right here in front of me. She lay on the bed, her head up toward the window. And she had Donna and me spank her. I understand that some were looking through the door, and I don't know about that, but we cried and cried, but we had to spank her. And um, we never had trouble smoking again. <laughs> I remember as a little boy, Mom left the door open for the purpose of all of us uh, watching this example. And, and I remember that uh, Mom said to Vaughn and Donna, there is something I haven't taught you. 
and therefore I'm the one that needs to be spanked. And, and I remember watching Bon and Donna sob and cry if I, they were spanking mom, and I made up my mind that I was never, ever going to use tobacco myself because I did not want to spank mom. <laughs> That didn't happen just to Vaughn and Donna. It happened to some of the older ones and also uh, some of the younger ones. Uh, if Ellen D is, uh, is out there. Yeah, anyway, uh, she'll be coming in. Um, I mentioned uh, that uh, we mentioned we went to the library, uh, genealogy library in, uh, in, over in Boise. Oh, Ellen D, come here. Uh, we were just talking about Vaughn and Donna getting uh, to have to spank Mama. And yes, what happened to you and Barbara? Well, they told all of us not to eat the apricots, on the ap green apricots on the apricot tree right out the side. So immediately we did. And Mother Beth took the four boys and paddled them. Grandma took Barbara and I and took us out to the woodpile and told us to pick a stick. Norma, naturally, we picked a little one, and she told us that wasn't large enough, so we picked a bigger one, and then she explained that she hadn't taught us right, and we were to spank her. Well, while <laughs> we were both bawling and just <laughs> spanking her, and she was going, harder, we were going, ah, 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 trying to spank her harder, harder, and then we came in and had to sit in the hall right in here, and we were just boobing and bawling, and the boys couldn't understand why we were crying, because we hadn't even been spanked, but it was a very much of a learning experience. So this is one of the ways she, she did teach us. Uh, Bill and, uh, and Ben and I all were taught uh, but to go to the genealogy library in Boise. I remember that distinctly. Oh, and the so, archives? Uh, yeah, the archives. And did you need to say anything about it, Bill? Yeah, uh, this was a good experience for me for several reasons. We went with Dad, uh, and uh, it was a good thing. We went with Dad to, because we knew at noon, Dad would buy us some hamburgers. And hamburgers were a big treat to us. And, uh, and one particular day there, uh, Dad come to a dead end, and we could not find a particular name. We searched and searched, and anyway, we went away from the uh, archives, very discouraged. Went home, and, and uh, we told Mom of the experience and so forth. We went to bed that night. Ben woke up the morning all excited because he had a dream. And he all excited and says, I know where to find that. I know where the book is in the library. I, I need to go back. And it was interesting. Mom didn't want Ben to forget the dream or forget anything that he had had there. And so Bob and I had to do Ben's chores and all this stuff. And we thought, we was kind of like Lemon and Lemuel. What's this? younger brother of ours is doing, getting these visions and so forth. And anyway, we went to the library and Ben was so excited about getting out of the car and running into the library, and he did, and he ran right to the book and pulled it out, brought it to Dad, and says, Dad, it's in here, and so forth. But I'll never, ever forget that. Mm -hmm. Bill, could you keep on going there? it was there. Uh, you talk about, uh, yeah, it was there, uh, about this truck that uh, you and Bud, uh, you were involved Turn in. Trevor. Okay, um, Bud <coughs> was the one that cashed the check, I remember, and Emer Farnsworth was with us in the car. We was bringing him home from school, too, and we got the milk check, and Mom told us to cash it and to bring it home. It was in a row, I remember. It was rolled up, the ball of money, round, and... Brought it home and give it to mom. Mom counted it and $10 was missing. And mom first blamed us and so on. Um, uh, oh, first, Bud had left the money out in the car on the seat. And mom wanted to know where the money was. Went out and got it and it was still in the row with a rubber band around it. It's the way the creamer gave it to us. And, um, and we brought it in. And the um, 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 and mom counted it, and ten dollars was missing. Mom first blamed us, and so forth. and then she blamed Emer Farnsworth. And mom really got in trouble at Farnsworth because one of her kids was blamed for stealing ten dollars, and uh, because she called and asked if they found ten dollars and so forth. She was handling it very well, but Farnsworth 
thought we were blaming their boy now and so on. Um, anyway, the $10 wasn't found. And then we got a letter from Vaughn on an experience. And we're going to turn this now over to Vaughn to tell about that experience. And then I'll end about out what happened here on our end. Sheila and I were married in July. <coughs> and shortly after our marriage, we were called on a full-time stake mission, Boise Stake Mission, um, on an Indian reservation down in the Owyhee County uh, to the uh, Owyhee Indian um, Reservation of Shoshone Indians. And we were there uh, into the winter. And uh, it was very cold, very cold. It got to 27 below zero. That's the coldest I've ever been in any weather. And we had a little Willie's car, and we had no gas. We, we, our missionary work had come to a stop because we had no gas, and we couldn't afford gas. And um, uh, Sheila and looked all through her purse and all around. I looked through all my pants, everything that we had, looking for money. And Sheila looked through her purse again and so forth. And, and we, we just didn't have any money, so we were stopped in our missionary work. And and uh, we prayed, and, uh, as usual. The next morning we got up, Sheila went into her purse, and right in the most obvious place was the $10 bill. It was not there before. And uh, she knew that uh, a divine uh, intervention had taken place. And so we wrote of the experience, home. And then uh, I'll, I'll let Bill finish the story. When Mom got that letter uh, from Vaughn, about the ten dollars, then it all came together. For mom. And she knew that like Vaughn said, divine intervention took over, whether it was the three D fights or John the Beloved or somebody, but mom knew that that ten dollars came off of that roll from the milk check. And um, so, that, so that they could put gas in their car. And uh, Vaughn, or mom came to us and apologized to us. She made sure that uh, Farnsworth were apologized to and made right because she understood now where the $10 come from. Bill, could you go ahead now with seven? <clears throat> okay, this will be quick. Um, there was a man coming out to uh, talk to mom about taxes. And this was um, um, uh, during dad's being gone as a prison, a prisoner of war and so forth. And mom didn't want to talk to anybody about taxes. Um, and so she, um, he was coming out. And I remember when he drove in that it was a brand new green pickup, government pickup. And she told us ahead of time, put on your swimming suits, and I want you to go and get some feathers out of the uh, turkey coop and some um, tar out of the bucket. And you get ready to tar and feather his car. And, and I remember him coming in, and uh, we were all ready, and we had sticks, shingles, to put the tar on, and we was going to tar his seat, his front seat in his pickup. And that guy come running out and chased us. And he says, and when he chases you, you run around, run down and jump in the canal. And he can't get you and swim across. And so we did. We ran down. And that guy, I remember him yelling back at mom, I'll get you, that type of thing. Anyway, he finally left mad. And mom was wise enough to call uh, President Z. Reed Millar, who is an attorney, and tell him what she had done and Millar laughed, and he says, good. He says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And, and anyway, she, he just laughed. But that was a good experience. You did tar okay. and feather the seat? No, you no. never did tar and feather the seat. <coughs> at Mom's funeral, President Millar said she was the most amazing woman he had ever met. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Barbara's. I put this one down here because this story is a real classic. And I, it was just worth telling, and you'll never hear it except maybe here. Um, and I realized it was done up in Canada on a raft. 
a time that just mom and I were fishing. On the Columbia? And on the Columbia, where the Ponderé come into the Columbia River there, uh, that old gold mine up there. Yeah, we got talked into an old gold mine. Anyway, mom and I were fishing on that raft, and we learned that grasshoppers was the thing that the fish were taking. And so, and grasshoppers were very scarce. So we'd catch a grasshopper, and I'd put it on the hook, and you catch a fish every time. Well, so mom, because grasshoppers were so scarce, mom got the idea that, well, gee, we'll take a grasshopper, and we'll divide the grasshopper into three pieces, the head, the main body, and the tail. And I watched mom with her tender little fingers and her, her fingernails rip the head off of a grasshopper and then go down and rip the tail off. And then she'd cradle those carefully in her hands and say, okay, now, Bill, just put one of these on. And we were catching fish on every piece. <laughs> every piece. And we had fish that, fish that night with fried onions and potatoes. Um, but that's how we caught fish. My mm -hmm. fishing trip was more. Well, this is, we're now in the, uh, what we call the boys' bedroom. This is the other uh, addition uh, with the two bedrooms. We extended the uh, west end of the house here. And uh, so this is where we slept as boys. Uh, and one of the things that happened here is uh, Bud was involved in. Well, Bill and Bob and I uh, uh, went to the, we'd, we wanted to go to the movie at the new drive-in theater in Meridian. And so we would talk mom and dad into going to bed early because uh, we we were we wanted to think that we we wanted them to think we were tired, and so we would sneak out the window here, and uh, let the car coast down the road and uh, and then I think was this uh, when we would uh, put uh, two of you in the trunk of the car and we would drive into the theater and well, and uh, watch the film. Even more than that, though, we would wait till the first uh, film was over with, and we would just turn our lights in and go the exit route into the movie theater. Okay, Bill. One of these times, Bob and I decided we wanted to go to a movie, and we talked the folks into going to bed early. We've been working in the garden all day, and we were very tired, and it's time to go to bed. And Anyway, we got them to go to bed, and they went to sleep, and... We snuck out the window, and I told Bob, I said, now, Bob, you, we've got to be very quiet. You couldn't turn lights on or anything. You wake the folks up. So you run way down to the bottom of the hill. So Bob ran way down to the bottom of the hill where uh, Mersdorf's are, clear to the bottom, and I'll just let the car coast. I want him to start, start it. I'll let no it coast lights. down. No lights or anything. I'll just let it coast down there. And this was the Red Hudson. I'll let it coast down there, and and uh, and all at once, crash. I thought I was on the road, and I smacked right into the the railing of the bridge, and half of the car was hanging over into the over the canal. In the water. <laughs> yeah, hanging over. Just about lost the, cana the car right in the canal, and it really surprised me. And old Bob heard the big crash, so he come running up. What happened, Bill? I says, I don't know. You missed the, the bridge. Missed, I missed the bridge. <laughs> so we uh, were trying to figure out a lie or something, but anyway. Well, we, you couldn't back it up. Yeah. It wouldn't back it. just up. sat there and spin. So we went and harnessed the horses, <laughs> harnessed the horses and hooked them up and come, brought them down and pulled the Hudson back uh, out onto the road. Uh, and the wheels of the Hudson, the because tire. of done, it broke the tie rods, and so they were going like this down the road, and and when you hit the pavement, they'd really scream, like you had your brakes on all the time. And I remember going to seminary that morning with the wheels screaming all the way. This, um, this story should be blotted. It's not very it's, good it's, it's, not <laughs> very, it's not a very good story. But anyway, that's what happened. Because when we came back, when we came back, to, uh, we knew Mom had to know, and so we came back and we made up the story that we went over to the bishop's wife, who is our piano teacher, uh, and uh, saying that we just had to get some music. We, and we were on our way there. We couldn't get the car started, and so we left the lights off, and that's how it happened. How could you lie like I that? I don't know. We were good, good at it. Very good. You're not bad. You're shameful. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read? Did you read?
I think I'm next with a, next with a story. Um, Floyd, my brother Floyd and I were really close. We were about a year and a half apart. He was a year and a half older than I was. But he was very, very bashful and shy, uh, around girls especially. In fact, I, I don't think for, uh, for two or three years he ever asked a girl out to date. He asked me to ask her out. And I would set up his dates. And then I'd set up my own date and we'd double date together in many instances. Uh, so he, his shyness really put me on the spot to find dates. In fact, uh, when he was ready to go on his mission, uh, he, had, he mom had picked up a new family that moved into the ward, the Earl family, and uh, one of the daughters, Alice. Uh, she says, that's the kind of girl, Floyd, I want you to marry. Uh, but Floyd was going on his mission. Come on up and tell me more about that, Floyd. Well, she offered, she, uh, mom... <laughs> Mom offered me, uh, my wife will kill me for this, but she offered me $5 if I'd take Alice Earl out, out on the date. And $5 is a lot of money at those times. And I thought, well, it's fine. And she had furnished the car, too, and gas. So I took her out on a date. You know, I, I never discontinued dating her. Yeah. And, and so when Floyd She's went on. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I set up most of his other dates. But, my, but Mom says, uh, I want Floyd to marry Alice Earl. But he was going on his mission, and he went. It would be gone two years. So mom asked me if I would date Alice while Floyd was gone so that no other boy would date him. And that's what I did almost for two years. I dated Alice and saved her for Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> and See, Floyd came home and married her. <laughs> He's my brother's keeper. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Anyway, he did end up marrying her. How many he, kids do you have, Floyd? Well, yeah. 14. Only 14 kids and, uh, for Alice. And Alice is just one of the w most dear friends that Jean and I have. On one of the dates, it was on a New Year's Eve, and this was a special evening. Floyd and I had planned these dates for quite a while because it was a big steak dance in Boise, and to go to Boise was a big thing for us Meridian country boys. But anyway, uh, we, uh, so we went to Boise on our date to the, to the dance, the steak dance. And uh, the dance went till after midnight, a lot of the, like a, a New Year's Eve dance would do. Then we went to a midnight show <laughs> afterwards. We told mom before we left on our date, she says, we probably won't get home until morning. <laughs> we just, mom laughed and said, sure. And we laughed, but uh, we were kind of serious about that. Well, we went to a, a midnight show after the dance, got out about three o'clock. Well, we saw up on the hill, up on the bench uh, of Boise, a big glow in the sky, and there was a, we, had, we drove up to it, and there was a house burning down, and we sat there and watched that house burn for at least an hour, the, the, the fire, and it was an exciting time, and later the next morning we found that in the paper that a person had burnt to death in that home. Well, anyway, by the time that was all over, we got home about 5 o'clock or 5.30 in the morning, and it was still dark, of course, uh, and, uh, and so we crept in through this back door, and normally we would stumble all over milk buckets and make lots of noise. But this time we snuck in without turning the lights on and we, ne and we never made a sound. And the bed was right here and Floyd slept on that side and I slept on this side. And we sat down on the bed. Floyd sat down on the bed to take his shoes off and very quietly get ready for bed. And, and then I sat down beside Floyd and I said, Floyd, move over. He says, I am over here. And I, so I flipped on the light and I'd sat right on mom's lap. <laughs> She was waiting up for us and was livid. Uh, she, her biggest problem and concern was, what do you think the, the parents of those girls are going to think, you getting them home at 5 o'clock in the morning? Well, they did. Those girls' mothers and, uh, had the police out looking for us, we found out later. Well, Mom, she really, really let us have it. And she just kept jawing at us and finally ran out of breath and went back to bed. And her room was right there. And... Um, and about 10 minutes later, Dad came in, and he says, move over, boys. Mama's so mad I can't sleep with her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bud, you come on back up here, because uh, <coughs> you need to be in on this one. Hey, Bob, that, that, that doesn't have any redeeming you know, features. Let's, let's oh, no, i got to tell this, this one. Are you on 11? I'm on 16. Uh, the uh, what happened there because I was uh, uh, involved with that I one. Don't even remember that. I know you don't remember it, but I sure do because I learned a lesson. Uh, Bud was late coming in, and Mom uh, is a light sleeper, and uh, she came in about uh, one o'clock, yeah. and uh, uh, 
snuck in quietly and everything, and, and Mom uh, opened the door to let him have it and saw him kneeling at his bed right here, saying his evening prayer, and uh, she just quietly closed the door. And she told us the next story. She says, you know, he says, if he can come home and say his prayers, there must not much happen bad that night. <laughs> and uh, That's so. why I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> I didn't see her. <laughs> no, you didn't ever see her, but I sure did. And I learned a great lesson there. Let me add just one of my own experiences. Stan Cole and I double dated a lot. And we took our dates home, and we were very tired. We were really tired after a big dance and so forth. And so uh, after taking our dates home, Stan Cole was driving, it was his car, and we came to a railroad, a railroad crossing, and it was a freight train uh, crossing, and it was a real long one, a real long one. So we just sat there, waiting for it. We both went sound, we both went sound asleep, and at about six o'clock in the morning, Stan woke up and then woke me up. We went home, he took me home, and Mom was milking the cows, and was she mad? Oh, was she mad? <laughs> She wouldn't even listen to me, and she says, no boy out this late all night with a girl can, can come home virtuous. Well, I tried to explain to her what exa the whole truth. I tried to tell her the whole, but we never did convince her. You know, I tried to tell her that the year before, Vaughn stayed out later than we stayed out at 5 o'clock. I never could convince her of that either. We were just following your example. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, um, could you, uh, you have quite a few here. Did you? Finish up here. Well, uh, let's, the, let's the, the, <laughs> the, t the time that Bud, yeah, the time that Bud ran away from home, um, the crazy guy, he come to me, and Bud don't give away anything. He wasn't going to give away anything. But all at once, he started to come to me, and he says, Bill, um, I don't need this anymore. Um, you can have it. And he started giving me things, just giving, giving away things. And, and I couldn't figure out what he was doing. And, and all at once, Bud took off. And he was gone for how long, Bud? Probably a week or two. Uh, it was at least but two I, weeks. I, I, need, I need to say something. I'll let you bring it. All right, right. come on up. I'll let you defend yourself. But anyway, Bud ran away from home, and uh, we all felt bad. The whole seminary class uh, felt bad. They were just about went into a fast for him and so forth. But uh, they really felt bad for him. Well, what had happened, I got poor grades in school on my report card, and Mom grounded me uh, on a sweetheart's ball, I think, with, with, with a, tree, a priest, a priest girl. Priest. Girl. Priest. priest. And um, I uh, just decided to uh, run away from home, and I did, and after I got down to San Francisco, and by the way, as I, pulled in, as I pulled into San Francisco, just as I come down some of the hills and, and out of the, out of the, uh, the mountains, I uh, went to stop at, a, at the first stoplight, and the brakes failed on this old 35 Chevy that we had, that you and I fixed up. Mm -hmm. The brakes failed on it, and I ran right into the back of this car and damaged it quite a bit, and really damaged the front of my car. But it didn't ruin the radiator or anything. And I got out and talked to the guy, and I said, gee, I'm sorry, my brakes must have been bad. And he says, are you from Boise? And I says, uh, I'm, I mean, reading. And he says, yeah. I says, yes. And he says, I'm from Caldwell. And um, he says, just go across the street over there and tell him to fix your brakes, and my insurance company will take care of this. And so um, I was relieved at that. And then after um, being there for a, a while, I got to thinking about mom and dad and, uh, and about the, the damage that I had done about hurting mom. So I wrote a letter and, and I put my telephone number on the letter. I don't, know how, I don't know how I did it or why, but I put my telephone number on the letter and when the letter got here, Donna called me up and she says, Bud, if you don't get yourself home right away, your mom's going to have a nervous breakdown. And that's all I needed to hear, and I was on my way home the next, the next morning. I, I do remember, though, all those boys and girls, that kind of put Bud on the map. Here he'd run away from home, but for some reason they loved him a lot more than they did any of He's the rest famous. of us. He was famous. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, did you want me to go after that? Yeah. 
All right. Uh, this experience that um, we had with Mark in Idaho Falls Temple. I don't know if you want to go into that or not, Bob. I was yeah, just go ahead I was a seminary just teacher then. Just mention it. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, I taught seminary uh, that morning, and and Mark had been killed, and about a year had passed, um, and that that particular morning, Joanne and I were preparing to go to the temple, the Idaho Falls Temple. We drove down there, and when you go into the temple. Uh, you can ask for names under Bennett E. Packard. And so I did, and they said, well, there isn't any. And unbeknownst to me, one of the other secretaries had overheard the conversation, and she says, I've got a name here that you might want. And she reached back on the um, one of those brown filing cabinets on top and pulled and gave me a card. And I looked at it, and I looked at the date and so forth, and then I says, well, this is my brother, Mark. And she says, well, would you like to go through for him? And I says, yeah. And so... Um, Mark was 13 when he was killed? 12. 12. And I said, sure. And, and so, and I remember of going through for him and being ordained an elder for him and, and all that, and it was just a choice, choice experience how that happened and how I got his name. And I asked one of the uh, temple workers there, told him the experience, and his answer was, those things happen here all the time. Well, you, phoned, and so, you phoned us and asked if it was okay if we did cross him yeah. as we were doing fathers. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. That is. Uh, <clears throat> we have here now uh, Barbara in a different dress. Could you tell us about this, Barbara? I sure can. We've already talked about Mother of the Year in the other room. Okay. Um, this is a, a suit. It's 100% wool, and I'm dying in it right now. It's so hot. But uh, that Mom purchased when she was selected as Idaho Mother of the Year. And uh, I, I just think it's the most classy suit. And I used to think Mom was a giant of a woman. I, all I remember is looking up to this mighty woman. And I can't believe that it fits me <laughs> exactly. So uh, the skirt, the waist, and I used to always think, I mean, this is, a, uh, this is a snug waist. And I used to remember Mom as having quite a full tummy from having all the children, but it fits me. So you know how what size she was when she was selected as Idaho Mother of the Year. And then uh, when, when she went on that airplane with Dee and, and Bill and... And, um, and, Dad. and Dad, yeah, Dee and Bill and Dad. Uh, this is the suit that she wore. And um, from Bountiful mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. uh, to and, um, these are the earrings that she wore. And Mom wore these earrings a lot. Um, they're just a, a very simple, probably very cheap little earring. She never had her ears pierced. She never had her ears pierced. And um, that's the dress she wore in that airplane accident. And this yeah. is the dress, and this is her own blood that she shed that day. And there's some there's some blood on the back. Uh, the kick pleat, if you'll notice, has a terrible tear up here at the top. And so I would say, from the pressure of the airplane crash, uh, Mom would not have worn a skirt with a, a damaged kick pleat. She she was a seamstress, and she would have repaired it. But this is the way it was. And I don't know if the suit has been cleaned. I assume that it has. Mm -hmm. uh, it I has. Don't it you has. don't think it has? But uh, this is the suit that she wore, was wearing when she died. Oh, she was elegant in it. And, the, and oh, also she was the elegant. fact that she wore those earrings when after Mom died, they came in with that red velvet cart and put it on the, lifted her over and put it on the cart. And... She'd had a string of beads, so the biggest one, probably that big around. Yeah. And they were, several of them, embedded in her back where she had laid against them, and I thought and it couldn't must move. have been painful. Couldn't move. But she didn't know. Well, and, uh, you know, this is a very tender story for me because um, uh, the area that the plane crashed was on the range mountains of my husband's parents. And uh, when Dee got out of that plane and ripped out the compass 
and used his binoculars. He looked on both sides of the mountain, over in towards Burley, and then over towards uh, the Utah, uh, towards the Salt Lake, the Salt Lake, actual, the lake area. And he saw this shiny, shiny building top shed, top uh, a galvanized shed. And Dee said the spirit told him to go that direction which was 13 miles. It was four miles to Burley, uh, or to the home that he saw towards Burley. But the spirit told him to go the greater de direction, and he walked into the ranch, and Jay's two brothers were on top of the haystack doing some haying, and one said to the other, look at that drunk man coming down the path. He'd run 13, mi 13 he, miles. And he was staggering. He had blood all over his face. His nose was nearly ripped off. And, and, uh, and as they just stood and watched him, as he D got closer, they said, he's not drunk. He's hurt. And so they both ran down off of the haystack, ran to the aid, and Jay's parents came out the door, and, um, and Jay's mother wanted Dee to come in so badly into the home so that she could nurse him. And he said, no. He says, I've got to get back. My parents and my brother are in the plane, and they may not even be alive. And so they went back, and it was Chet and Daryl, Jay's two brothers, that went, and they, they cut off branches off of the um, cedar posts, the cedar trees out in the desert. It was just desert and snow. And they were the only people in the entire valley that had a four-wheel drive. And, and, they, and a winch. And a winch. No one else had it out there. No one could afford it, and they had just got it. And, and, uh, and Mom Kunzler put in all her blankets that she had and just put them in the back of the truck. And, and then Daryl and Chet. And you saw my husband. He is 6'2". He's a big man. His brother is twice that size. He wasn't her husband then. She oh, no, I hadn't met him. He was on his mission, I, was he? Mm, he no, he was in the Army. Oh. And so, that anyway... That four-wheel drive Jeep pulled, pulled that whole Jeep right up the mountain. They would hook in and pull itself up. It they got mm -hmm. into that Jeep, and they got 100 miles, I mean 100 yards, from the airplane crash scene. And, and Bill heard the, the, the truck tires spinning and he sobbed like a baby because he knew that there was hope he knew that there was somebody there to rescue those bodies Ma dad was unconscious mom was going in and out of consciousness and bill just kept hitting mom with a magazine he couldn't move but he kept hitting her with a magazine to keep her awake because she kept wanting to, she said bill please let me go to sleep just let me go to sleep she was, so cold. she was so cold and the window had been blown out of the plane and the snow was blowing in on mom's body on this beautiful suit and <clears throat> mom really wanted to go then she was just Nearly dead. She gave all of her wraps to Bill and Dad. Yeah, she did. Oh. She tried to get Bill to come back where she was. And Bill couldn't. Bill couldn't move. And then, and so I, I just want to finish on Daryl and Chet, and and when they went to the airplane, and they took those bodies out, Daryl wrote a paper at Utah State University on this. Call to the rescue was the the name of the paper, and he he said. Uh, we stretched those cedar posts through the sleeves of our Levi jackets and made stretchers and laid these bodies on those stretchers. And he said, every step in that snow I knew could mean the life of a human being. And he says, every step. Mom grunted, moaned because probably there was bones that were just crushed to her in her body and but everyone she moaned and then they put those bodies in the back of that jeep laid them down and went down those snowy rough sagebrush and mountains uh, all the way in to probably would you say about a hundred and maybe maybe about 90 miles into to Tremont. To but there's so much more to the story. Jay's parents were heavily involved in getting an ambulance out there. Well, and there was a doctor and, visiting. And then when they were taken to the nearest store, which was about, let's see, 13 and plus another seven, maybe about 25 miles to the nearest little store in Park Valley, 
I went into the store and it just happened to be that there was a couple there visiting from Salt Lake City named Hamer Reiser and his wife and he was a medical doctor, she was a nurse and it ended up that they were our relatives from Dominicus Carter and um, all the people in Park Valley just came in and I wanted to serve these people and then later on after I met Jay, my husband, we went to Park Valley to church when I was just dating him and and all these people would come up and say, I served your mother. I did this to your dad. I wiped the blood off of your mom's face. And I did this, and I did this, and your brother, and, you, and, and your one brother that could walk was such a trooper. And it was just such an overwhelming spirit. And every time I go to Park Valley, I relive this. And it's just, it's just I'm so blessed, but I think mom and dad did this just for me, so that I could meet my wonderful husband. <laughs> Sorry I took so long. I just want to make a comment uh, of some of the things that took place when I was with mom and dad up in the plane. When Dee went and left to go for help, uh, and I was up there alone, my back was broken to the point that uh, I, I couldn't turn over. I tried to turn one way and the other, one of my back bones was nearly sticking out my back, a big bulge, and um, and so I just got myself in a comfortable position and trying to hold the wind from blowing the snow in through the windows with a blanket over the windshield and maps on the side windows I'd stuffed in the best I could. But you need to know that while I was there, Mom, for some reason, was not concerned about herself. She would pass out periodically, and then when she'd come to, her mind was always on us kids, on her children. Um, she, she'd say things like, um, uh, where is Dee? She would forget that she had asked that before, where is Dee? And I'd tell her that he went for help. Let's pray for him. Um, and... Um, and then I would complain because I felt that my, my uh, right leg was frozen. And all the time it was paralyzed and because I couldn't feel it and I thought it was frozen. And mom would say, Bill, why don't you come back here the best you can and, and, and cuddle up with us and we'll try to keep warm. And I remember I put my foot up over the seat, hung it up over the seat, Mom reached forward and grabbed my shoe, but when she reached forward, undoubtedly some ribs punctured that was punctured through her her um, her um, lungs. It made her scream, and she fell back with my shoe in her hand, and my shoe fell down behind the seat. And now I was without a shoe for that foot, um, and it was very very cold. Um, I remember uh, eating a, a candy bar that was frozen and trying to peel an orange, and it was frozen. But um, uh, Mom, she was always concerned about us, how we were doing. And I remember saying, well, Bill, um, make sure that Barbara is taken care of. She mentioned Barbara. Make sure she's taken care of, okay? She was worried about Barbara because she, she was the youngest. And we, uh, Joanne and I, took care of Barbara. And I gave him fits. Mm -hmm. she, she was a teenager, and you could tell it. But, uh, but we done our best to take care of her, and we left her. Uh, <clears throat> one of the ends of this story is I was on my mission at the time and was not there when the accident happened. But when I came home, I wanted to go up and see the area. And Bill says, well, let's just go up and we'll go rabbit hunting And uh, at the same time. And when we went up, uh, then all of a sudden, Dad wanted to go. And then all of a sudden, Cleo wanted to go. And then Barbara said, hey, I'd like to go. And it was when she walked into the ranch there, she brought a date with her, that uh, Jack, uh, Jay Kunstler then was on top of the stack, and he saw little Barbara down there and fell in love with her while he was looking at her from the stack. And uh, married her. True, sure, he did. <laughs> he he didn't lay, lay eyes on anybody else from then on. Well, let me just tell you something. Two weeks before that, Jay was really discouraged. And now out at the ranch, 
you don't see another house in no sight. Girls ready. There, there's no nothing out there. And and Jay had just finished some schooling, and he was out at the ranch helping with all the farm work, and and um, really low, emotionally low. And his mom said, "Son, have I done something to hurt you?" And he says, "No, mom." He said, "I'm just lonely out here." He says, "If I stay out here, I'm never going to get married." And she says, "Jay." You just live right, and she'll come to your doorstep. <laughs> but that's the honest truth. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> that's the uh, story. And how many kids did you end up with? Eight. Eight. <laughs>
Mom was all upset. She was angry. So she grabbed the whole box of 22 shells angrily and come down and threw them in the furnace. And then we were upstairs, and you know that one unusual register there that's in the kitchen? Yeah. All at once, those 22 shells started blowing off. And Bud and I, we saw the smoke start coming out of the, that register. And Mom, she says, what's happening? And we said, well, you threw the 22 shells in the furnace, and they're starting to blow off. <laughs> and, but anyway, um, I think Mom learned a lesson on that one. The last story we wanted to tell here is that I came down for a bottle of fruit... I must have been about <clears throat> eight or ten years old, and I was coming up the stairs there, and Mom uh, took a piece of uh, linoleum, or uh, it was about a, a two feet wide a piece of linoleum or, or formica, and she just reached around the door there and just threw it, and it just went like that, and I was going halfway up the stairs, and the corner of that hit right here, less than a half inch below my eye and it cut deep and hit an artery and I was squirting blood uh, as I came on out and uh, when I turned the corner there it would squirt blood from the top of the stairs all the way across the porch and hit the wall and Bill came running out of the kitchen because I was screaming and I started holding it like that and I said, I've got it, I've got it. Bill says, let me see, let me see. And I said, I've got it, I've got it. And he thought I had my eyeball in my hand. And I says, and I, all I was doing, and I didn't know anything about putting direct pressure on, but it did. I never went to the doctor or got a stitch, and I don't even know if I got a scar there. Nope. But that hit the artery direct. 